the idea for Henry Bramble came about from a um, summer workshop um, called Film Steps. And basically it's a five day workshop where children get the opportunity to, to develop and shoot a film and then um, it's presented at the local cinema for, for their family and friends. And the usual way I go about uh, generating ideas for those stories is to play a game to come up with a story with a beginning, middle and end that they could then present to the rest of the children. Um, and then of course they would make a vote of who their favourite one was. On this occasion they picked an idea that wasn't a story, it was more of a, a camera trick. A girl had this idea that she wanted to see a boy running her down a corridor with a peacock feather or a, or a, or a ruler, um, swishing it about and then suddenly we flip to see his imaginary world and that he's actually dressed as a knight and he's waving a sword around. And so I had to come up with a way of developing a story around that concept. So we had a little whiteboard and I said, um, okay, well, if the boy is um, full of imagination and he's the goody, then who's the baddie going to be? It's going to be somebody the opposite to that. So they're going to have, they're going to be older and they're going to have no imagination. So we decided that a father would be a good antagonist. So if he didn't have an imagination, how would that work? And so I came up with the idea of what if he was a writer that couldn't write, he's got writer's block and his child is running around, this imaginative child is running around, uh, distracting him. Uh, and you can see the irony straight away that if he had only just learnt to play with his son, then that would spur on his imagination and that would hopefully take his writer's block away. Elliot, what have I told you? Well, I've forgotten the line. So anyway, that was the, that was a general idea. Um, um, and he just appeared to an imaginary world where he had to save his, um, his father from zombies. How many times have I told you? Never turn your back on the zombie. Duck! Oh. Let's go! Hang on, Dad. Why are you in a dressing gown? I don't know. It's your imagination. And that's what the children wanted to do, so we, we saved him from zombies. Elliot, snap out of it! Now look what you've done! The main kind of core idea of that story stayed with me for many, many, many weeks later to the point where I decided I have to sit down and, and develop this further. And uh, while I was working at the uh, Crown Court in Maidstone as an usher, as a temporary job, there was a lot of uh, points of law where the um, jury had to go out for some time, often up to th three hours or maybe a whole day. And uh, I found that that was a good opportunity where I could actually do some writing and that's where I developed Henry Bramble and that's how it came about. The character of Geoffrey Cranbrook came from the resident judge at Maystone Crown Court. Everybody remembers a teacher, a particular teacher or a headmaster or a mistress who, had, um, who was very fair um, but didn't uh, stand for any, any messing about or trouble and stuff. And uh, this judge was very much like that. You know, he could uh, silence a room with just a look and he was to be feared in court and yet out of court he was a charming and generous kind man. And I liked the dynamic of that and that's where sort of Geoffrey came from in the sense that Geoffrey's career and his life had, had slowly drained his imagination from him because he, he had to be serious all the time, he had to look at stuff responsibly and he was a very responsible person and, and in being so responsible for so long all that creativity and immediacy of, of uh, just dropping everything and doing something because you can had gone. Um, so it made sense that he, had, he was a high court judge. The character of Henry Bramble, I think, came from well the fact that um, my wife was pregnant with our daughter and we were just coming up to the, the mid-pregnancy scan, which is where they tell you whether it is a, a girl or a boy. And we'd always both uh, imagined that we'd have a, a girl, so I suddenly started to panic. What if I had a boy? I want to be able to, to know him before he's born, if you know what I mean. So I had to stop and imagine what my son would be like. And in doing so, I think pretty much Henry Bramble evolved out of that. That's who Henry Bramble is, really, is, is my imaginary um, son. Uh, you know, he has a lot of similar traits to me in the sense that he's very curious about the world. He's creative. He's a little bit of a daydreamer. You know, he's uh, easily distracted. Negative points as well as positive. And yeah, that's, that's really where I, I got the core idea for Henry and, and how he would behave and, and what he was like. 
finding Henry Bramble was quite a challenge in that we didn't have a big budget, so we couldn't have a huge casting call of thousands and thousands of children. So we went over to London to children acting schools there, where we auditioned them at Hyde Park. Archie was one of them. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm Henry. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm Henry. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm Henry. Immediately he stood out because he came up to me and just said, hello, I'm Archie, nice to meet you, and shook my hand. And that was very much a Henry Bramble um, trait. He also had these very dreamy, doughy eyes, these big blue eyes that just used to just disappear off into the distance. And he, and he couldn't stop talking about anything. He was so excited about things and he, he could talk for, forever about anything and everything. And he generally had a curious mind. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Archie's playing Henry beautifully and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a smashing part for a kid. On set, he was such a pleasure to work with. He had a great sense of humour, he was very professional. Um, he entertained everybody with his endless stories and ideas and thoughts. And, uh, and he was a real joy to, to be around. And I just hope that he enjoys this film as much as I do and enjoyed his experience. I think he did, I think he had a great time. If we need another take, I'll go on that second take. Full toes. <laughs> Fifteen. <laughs> <laughs> Twenty. <laughs> Twenty one is my nose. Well, yeah. <laughs> <Ice lines. laughs> yeah. One of the most exciting things uh, making films, apart from explosions and stunts and things like that, and swords and fighting, is uh, is slime. <laughs> Uh, I love slime, I've used it quite a lot in, in, in many films and I'm always uh, fascinated by people's reluctance to, to use it excessively. Yeah, I think it's because the uh, it's wet and it's sticking and not stringing, is it? And again. Down. Yeah, good. Move right, on. Yeah, there was a scene basically where Henry has had his imagination taken from this voidacatron and I wanted his face, all around his face, to be covered in slime. The art department had this bucket of slime, which essentially was a bit like uh, wallpaper paste. And they were sort of gently dabbing this on his face and I was thinking, what are you doing? Come on, skewer it out, splat. Yeah. Thanks, Derek. Thanks, Derek. If you, look, if you look up to me, then it won't dribble smart. Oh, no, no, please. Yeah. Great, let's just get some plugs on, and then we're very wide on this as well. You know, you just want to smear it everywhere apart from obviously where it's used, you know, you want it to keep some away from his mouth. So the more slime on him, the more you're going to feel sorry for him. And the more the audience is going to go, ugh, yuck! <laughs> You'll thank me when you see it. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry. I really appreciate it. That looks good, yeah. You happy with that? I think. Archie enjoyed the idea that he was getting covered in slime, but at the same time, slightly nervous about um, whether or not it would come out of his hair or whether it would melt his face or something like that. Director's happy, so let's, let's step away. Okay, we're getting shot. Never restrain on stuff like that. Always, always put as much slime in a film or on an actor as possible. It's, um, it's the best thing. The Voidacatron's a CGI character, and I, I was concerned that there was nothing physically on set for the actors to, to play off. So um, when we were making Henry Bramble, I made a point of, in rehearsal of um, being the monster and acting out the monster. And uh, although I wasn't seven foot tall, I could do the growls and the <laughs> do all the noises. For the actors, it's, it's very useful. They get an idea of where the monster's gonna be, what the kind of movement it's going to be doing. And even if they can hear some growling off camera, it, it's enough to just help them visualise this seven foot horrible creature. One more step, that's it. Okay, now Henry, now! Don't rely just purely on actors' ability to imagine. Because if you've got three actors all imagining a monster, the monster's going to be in three different places. And, and you'll often find that People's eye lines are completely out. Come on, little fella. Come on. 
having somebody just imitating that creature through rehearsal gives everybody some kind of shared guide as to as to what they're looking at and where they're looking. One more step. One more step. Now, Henry. Now. Ah, good. Directing children in films is a is a very different skill to directing adults. They don't have or they don't need uh, the subtext. They don't, they they. They just need to know the surface level performance. And you give it that subtext in the editing. And uh, as Hitchcock used to describe, a man looking fondly at a, a child playing with the parents, his expression, if you then placed something else in front of him, like uh, an attractive woman, I think was, is a demonstration I, I saw on YouTube, makes his face have a completely different meaning. If you take Steven Spielberg, for instance, when when that, in Close Encounters, when that boy uh, looks up in awe at the, at the uh, spaceship, um, it works beautifully. But in, uh, in reality, what he did was he hired a, a child entertainer clown and did some juggling or something like that. And the boy was reacting to that, not at a giant spaceship. And so that's really how you, uh, how you direct children. Henry, run! And then you shout out, I can't see! Right, got it. Yeah. And you just go, ah! Acting something out physically is a lot quicker to communicate with a child than having to explain with them to, with words that maybe they don't understand or, or maybe you can't articulate properly. You have to you have to have fun with them. You have to be a child and uh, having an imagination, being creative, kind of requires you to have that child in you. And probably why I enjoy working with children is because uh, I, I get to be one again. Get to about one, two, three. Children get tired much quicker than adults. And once a child is tired, it doesn't matter how many takes you do, you'll never get the performance that you want. When that happens, the best thing you can do for you and that child actor is to send them home to get a good night's sleep and the next day they'll be full of beans and be able to give you the performance that, that you require. So that's good advice, unless of course you're trying to get that performance out of that child on the very last day of filming, which is what we had with Henry Bramble. You know, Archie had been running on adrenaline and excitement for the last two and a half days, and uh, we were getting to the third day in the afternoon, and uh, he, he basically crashed. There was not a lot I could do, um, because we didn't have another day for him to go home and get some rest. <laughs> there were two scenes or two shots that uh, I, I just couldn't get him to do what I wanted, and one of them was, um, when the, we had this bucket that was supposed to be the, uh, the, the trunk of the Voidacatron letting go of him. He was holding on and we had him on, a, a, on some steps, I think, and he had to jump backwards. I wanted him to sort of let go, to sort of go, to be sort of thrown backwards by it, as if the Voidacatron was throwing him off rather than him pushing away. And I just, I couldn't get him to do it and uh, time was ticking and the pressure was coming on and eventually I, I had to just go, okay, let's move on. Okay, we, 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 yeah. we really have to go. Cue. Yeah. Cut there. Uh, the other, uh, the other moment was um, was the very, I think probably one of the very last shots. It was very dark at this point. The sun had dipped behind the uh, had set, and I was just literally shouting everything. I mean, there were about, there was three of us. I think. I think the AD. I think Paul Copley and and I was shouting all sorts of stuff to Henry. Up your eyes again. <laughs> I can't see. Uh, well, run, watch out, watch out, come on! I can't see! Look, look up the sky and try and open it. I can't see! Try again, look up, look up! I can't! Rub your eyes then, but look up at the same time! And it, it was complete chaos, it was complete mess, it was, it was, it's not the way to make films. Just look up and rub your eyes and see the line at the same time. Don't say any lines, just look up and, and, and squint. All I needed was maybe less than two seconds. Okay, no more dialogue. Just keep opening your eyes and closing, opening your eyes and closing. Try not to focus. It's too stinging. Yeah, rub it again. But what, what else can you do, you know, when, they're, they're, when the kid's tired and they can't get the performance that you need out of them, all the rules go out the window. You just, you just scramble to try and get something. And we just kept shooting until eventually he got it. Then see the boy Akatron and look horrified. Cut there, good. That's probably a bad example of, uh, of directing and uh, uh, making films, but um, at the same time, when you're under that kind of pressure, 
uh, that's kind of how it, how it happens.